I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, what's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here at Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. Uh, Forgive me, everybody, uh, for the mix-up earlier. Uh, That was entirely my fault. And uh, so I apologize to everybody who showed up earlier and thank them for showing up earlier. And I hope they can all make it back. And thanks to those who are making it back here. That's right, we're doing a redo Uh, Yes, I'm looking forward to this as well. So go ahead and let everybody know that you're here. Remind them to come on back uh, if you're seeing this later, uh, as I know will be the case with uh, several of my classes. Uh, Then welcome to you in that moment in time. Peace in the future uh, and welcome. Greetings, everybody. Um, I'm very excited to have this conversation as well. And uh, let's get right to it. So I want to say before uh, I bring up our next guest that um, is, by the way, I'll just do it this way. Our guest is going to be today Dr. Joshua M. Myers, who, among many other things, is an associate professor of Africana Studies in the Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University. He is the author of, of today's subject of Black Study. He is also author of Cedric Robinson, The Time of Black Radical Tradition, of the Black Radical Tradition in 2021. And We Are Worth Fighting For, A History of the Howard University Student Protest of 1989 that came out in 2019. And that you can see us in discussion with uh, my former uh, colleague at Morgan State, Dr. Jelani Favors, uh, the videos at imixwhatilike.org. Uh, check that out. And he's also uh, the editor of A Gathering Together, a literary journal. Uh, but I want to say before I bring him up here that 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 in addition to all of that, it's it's perfectly telling that as I was making the error in the initial live a couple of hours ago and reaching out to him, that Dr. Myers was in a class, and that Being somewhat familiar as I am with academic life at an HBCU, uh, it is not uncommon for regardless of tenure or rank or seniority or whatever your position is that after any many amount of years that you might be, uh, as I'm not sure is the case with with him, but it's certainly the case with me and many others, uh, teaching a 4-4 or maybe a 3-3, that is four courses per semester, if you're not familiar with that which is a very heavy course load, I think, and indicative of a situation that is not encouraging to A, a quality of in-classroom teaching experience for both the student or the the faculty, or the outside of the classroom production of knowledge, as is the case with the work we're talking about today. So I wanted to take a quick moment to just add a little additional praise, regardless of what what I may think of the book, what I may or may not understand of the book, or what anyone else might feel, I think it is a profound accomplishment for anyone, particularly coming out of an HBCU with the partic- those conditions. And there are many others that work against the, this level of production, some of which I think we'll talk about today, that makes this work, uh, and as much as I've been able to read it and, and understand and grapple with it, it ha- is, I think, monumental and profoundly impressive. So I just wanted to say all that to, to, to before I, I do, as I am now, bring Dr. Myers up to talk about this new book of Black Study. Professor Myers, welcome to the program once again, and thank you very much. And again, congratulations, my man. Very impressive. Very impressive what you've done here. And oh, my bad. Let me unmute you. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, I feel like, you know, we we go back all the way to my undergrad years at Howard. You know, you probably don't, I'm sure you do remember. We no, I remember. Several times um, uh, to speak on campus. So it's like really interesting. I posted the uh, um, screenshot of the, of, the, of the YouTube for this conversation. And my current students is like, can, can you bring Jerry Ball to Howard? It's like, <laughs> it's like, of course I can. <laughs> of course you can. Anytime it would be an honor, and I appreciate that anyone so, there yeah. would want me to come through. So thank you. No, yeah. we do. I didn't. I didn't want to. I, I, I was. I figured some of it would come up. We do. We do go back a little bit, and 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 I wanted to actually make this point that we do go back. But I think 
it's fair to say that that you know and, and i want to add this not to 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 um praise the gap or whatever or the difference or the different locations or whatever uh mm -hmm. but to emphasize this for the point I'm trying to make about the quality of the work and what I think about what you've done here, that, that we don't, we're not, in, we're not the best of friends. We're not in the same cliques, right. we're not, you know, we know each other. We, we in the same circles where, you know, whatever, but, you know, yeah. so I, it's not like, so I'm, I, I say that to say, like, when I'm saying all of this, I don't want anybody to think, oh, he's just, you know, bigging up his boy. I mean, I consider you mm -hmm. a friend. I consider you a comrade and someone, whatever. But I it, I just want to make that clear. Absolutely. Like, I, I'm profoundly impressed with what you've done here. Uh, and again, especially it would be dope even outside, even if you had a one none and was making 10 times your salary like some and, and produced this, it would be impressive. Mm -hmm. But what I... It, and again, I'm not in your pockets. I'm not in your schedule. But what I think I understand of the HBCU experience to have done this is I'm, I, I can't get over how impressed I am by it. So congratulations. You know. Thank you so much for that. And thanks for acknowledging that. Um, I'm sitting in my sure. office right now, third floor of Founders Library, <laughs> hoping, hoping that nobody knocks on my door trying to get registered <laughs> or come in, you know, <laughs> you know, with issues. Because one of the things that we have to, as you know, one of the things that we do is not only do we teach, we yeah. also have to engage students beyond the classroom. And that's constantly happening. That's right. Um, you know, if I wasn't doing this, you know, I would be meeting with students, talking through ideas, but also talking through what they're going through at Howard. Um, right now, Howard is in an interesting place, and particularly for students who want to engage radicalism. It's scary and hard. And they don't know how to think. They don't, they know, they don't know what to do with the fact that Howard now is getting $90 million from the Department of Defense, right? It's like, should we do something? What should we do? Like, how is this going to affect my education, right? Because the Howard that they were sold is not necessarily that Howard, right? Um, and so they get here and they oh. experience levels of conservatism and they experience levels of, you know, the black, black bourgeois <laughs> agenda, whatever you want to call it, right? I mean, they call it black excellence now, right? <laughs> That's it's it's <laughs> nice rebranding of it though. It's nice, right? <laughs> the DOD is the logical extension of black excellence. We can now be excellent militarisms. <laughs> we have excellent militarism. Anyway. Yeah, man. We become in black studies, even at the HBCU, an oasis for these students. And so I wouldn't have it any other way. In fact, I told my I told the event, we had a, a launch event last week, last Thursday. I said, I love writing. I love doing you know, that kind of work, right? But that's not why I'm a, why I'm a professor. It's not why I come to the university. In fact, I didn't get any support materially for this book from the university, any, right? The university for me is you, students, right? And so I have to, I, not only do I have to teach, it's the only reason I stay is to teach. I could be doing any other thing and making the same amount of money probably, right? But the, it's the students. It's the students. I'm sorry to laugh at that, but yeah, that's the funny way of putting it. I could be doing this so many things. I could be doing for this same money, man. It's crazy. Yeah. I told my students I, I would rather be on a farm, like doing food security work, whatever. Like, but the fact that I get to teach y'all is really the real. It's the it's the only way. It's the only reason, in fact. I deal with all the other stuff that I deal with. It's because there's some there's a there's a there's a beauty in being in community with students who are looking for a thing and then realizing why I'm not why am I not getting that thing until I get into these kind of spaces. Mm. So I did as I said off air. I wanted to give you a chance to just I, I like to let folks just take a moment to explain their book as they see it. Um, but I'm very tempted to ask you to do it in, in light of what we were just starting with a question that I wanted you to, to ask, to, to respond to, that you bring up out of chronology from, so anyway, so forgive me, but you, you bring up this distinction, as I'm seeing it, and correct me, between the Black University and the HBCU. So as you, as you I don't know, is there a way... And maybe we could just separate the two and you could just talk about the book and we can come to that question later. But I was just thinking if there's a way to respond to that distinction 
as a way of explaining what you you see your book doing. But either way, however you want to do it, uh, you know. I it's, think it's, it's, a, it's that's a lovely way to enter into the conversation because we're being cited at the university, like that says something about the approach to knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. That the university is organized around. It's not just that, you know, there's a natural order of knowledge that just was always there. And then the universities, you know, just apply that natural order to reality, right? But it, but it assumes that it does. And every intellectual or academic area assumes that there is a natural order. But Blackness reveals that the natural order is unnatural. And we see that in broad relief when it comes to the distinctions that you just raised, right? When Black students come into Black institutions, they find it wanting because there is no natural order. And my reality, my experience as a Black person reveals that there is no natural order. And so how do we get our university education to be relevant to the world that we see, to the world that we experience? And at HBCU, that conversation happens almost immediately. But those people that are carrying that conversation are punished for having that conversation at HBCUs, right? You know, there's a there's a legacy of discipline and punish, if you will, uh, when it comes to us thinking beyond disciplines. The disciplines that we inherited, the disciplines that we reify sometimes, the disciplines that we think that we can't fight. And so the relationship between that and the book is that part of the energy around Black studies is that we need a separate institution or we need a radically changed institution in order for any of this to work. And when Black Studies emerges and it has this life that it has over the last almost 60 years, one of the reasons that we often fail at doing what we wanna do in Black Studies is because Black Studies wasn't just supposed to be a department, it wasn't just supposed to be a discipline, it wasn't just supposed to be this space that kind of accepted the norms of the academy as its own with blackface, right? And so this book is about getting back to the deeper questions that were raised, not only in that moment, but in other moments that said, we need to rethink knowledge itself. We need to rethink the structure of knowledge. We need to rethink the emergence of these spaces that we think are told are natural. Because when we actually think about our black lives, it reveals that these spaces come out of particular conditions. And in fact, it reveals that the university as a construct was really created in order to discipline black life. In fact, discipline all life, but certainly discipline black life. And so the contradictions that we think are that exist between a university like Howard or any HBCU uh, where black excellence gets framed or prioritized over black liberation, may not be so much a contradiction because these, these universities aren't really concerned about our liberation, they never were. And maybe black excellence is the actual mission. And so maybe it's not so much the contradiction that we think it is. Studying black life in the ways that the peoples that I talk about in the book study black life, help us see in that way, gives us clarity in that way so that we don't have, you know, we don't have to be disappointed anymore. We can just continue to do our work and, re and figure out, you know, how to destroy it all at some point, how to dismantle it all at some point. But certainly, we don't, we don't, we don't get to be seduced anymore when we think with people like Sylvia Winter or W. E. B. Du Bois about the structure of knowledge, not just whether or not Black life can fit into the pre-existing categories. So you, you so again, I, 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 um, as I, as I. I want to point out that if any at any point you feel like first of all I don't know exactly how we are on time so always just let me know if you whenever we got to start thinking about wrapping up or whatever I'm I'm here to I'm good to about 3:30 so we're good. Oh okay right so I might have to go before you unfortunately <laughs> but but yeah. But I want to say again I've already asked you off air I want this to to be part 1 of a discussion because as I was yeah. saying uh I've I've read as much as I could, as fast as I could, but it deserves so much more attention that, you know, I've, I've already redesigned my semester and two of my, two of my four classes are going to be using this text intimately all semester. So, so oh, I'd I like appreciate to that. To, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, I'd like to come back to, you know, to, you know, later, uh, um, you know, after a, a, a greater chance to, to, to get into it. Um, mm -hmm. But you you mentioned you know you mentioned that 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 we go back a little bit so and I know you remember the the 
WPFW, shout out to WPFW and our in our our crew's hate awards. Um <laughs> and I was I will let me be perfectly honest with you and everybody. Reading as much as I have, I went back and forth from the hateful grinning to honestly getting tearful, man. Like, like selfishly thinking about my own experience at Morgan, like the, the whole midlife, mid-career crisis, all this stuff. Students coming to me just this week after after class wanting to talk about what is going on. Um, uh, and, and in reading this, I'm like, damn, you know, but but the hateful part. I'm like, you. It feels like with each chapter, you are asking us to reconsider not only the people being considered, but what other people have been doing with them and their images and their arguments. Absolutely. I mean, so before we get to any of the specifics of the people, if, or unless you want to, you know, do that with any exact whatever, could you talk a little bit about that general concern that seems to thread through the work that that it, it it's yeah. And I'll just stop there. So I, I think we have, you know, among, I guess you can call them the current or modern day black academic, we have avatars mm -hmm. a lot for the thing that we think that we're doing. <laughs> and so, which is what, which is what you do when you don't feel that your place may be natural to the, the functioning of the place, right? And so you find someone who you think justifies your existence in that particular place. But you can only make these peoples into the avatar if you assume that their goals were the same as yours. And so I have a problem when Du Bois, for me, is at best a radical historian who breaks a lot of the consensus around certain moments in our conception of not only the United States of America, but Pan-Africanism. It becomes a problem for me when he becomes the person who justifies whether or not black people belong in the discipline of sociology or not. <laughs> That's all you got? <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, mm. I moved away from the hate into why this mm -hmm. is happening, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, part of what is happening is there's this attempt to create a, a space in sociology to interrogate race to interrogate the nature of inequality that's attached to race, which is not unlike what sociology has been doing for several years, in fact, maybe a hundred years or so. But in doing so, the notion that sociology can break us out of that or liberate us from that, I think gets inscribed in some of the logics. And to me, that ain't what Du Bois was trying to do. He's not trying to say sociology is a liberatory force for black people. <laughs> right? mm. And beyond that, the other the other move that I made, you know, is basically demonstrating why these disciplines can't be not only can't be liberatory forces, but in fact do the opposite. They work against our liberation. And it's Du Bois's recognition of that, right? That I think is more important than whatever contributions he made to those particular disciplines. He eventually makes a Make some make somewhat of a break. The word that I use is hesitance. He's hesitant before these spaces, right? Sylvia yeah, and I Winter, love what you do with Jacob that Carruthers. too, by the way. But sorry, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sylvia Winter, Jacob Carruthers, and Cedric Robinson make more complete breaks than the voice is able to make um, from these disciplinary areas. And so I think the fear around it is if I break from the discipline, I can't think anymore. I can't work anymore. I can't do the things that I want. And what I wanted to show folks is actually in the break, there's another side, right? After the break, there is Africa for Du Bois. After the break, there is a different conversation for Sylvia Winter that is rooted in a way of thinking and being that actually resonates with more people that we think that we are aligned with, which is our people, right? And so Black Studies methodologically, right? Even if you want to say methodologically, in fact, earlier in class, I was saying poetically. You don't have to use methodology or research, right? Mm. It's a way of speaking. Mm. It's a way of knowing that relates us to things that matter to us, right? It relates us back to who we are, but not just as scholars, but as Black people who live in Black communities, who work alongside Black communities, who are trying to survive like every, every other Black person, right? To me, that becomes not only the mission for scholars, it's the mission for our teaching, because everybody that we teach ain't going to become a scholar. And so I'm not wasting my time I'm trying to teach y'all research methodology that will make you tenurable. <laughs> I'm not doing that anymore. 
Mm. I want to teach in a way that allows you to relate to our people or relate back to our people in ways that those other areas that you're taking in university just cannot do. That's really where this approach comes from. And I think, you know, I don't want to get into the notion that, you know, these are the only scholars, the ones that I talk about that were doing this kind of work. But these were the ones that resonated for me in the time that I was grappling through this as not only a research scholar, but also as someone who was teaching Black students. Right on. Oh, man. Uh, so speaking of the people that you talk about, uh, just just very quickly, you start with June Jordan. As you mentioned, you talk about Du Bois, Sylvia Winter, Jacob Carruthers, Cedric Robinson, and conclude with Tony K. Bambara. Uh, in the beginning, in the intro, when you're talking about June Jordan, and I'd, and I'd like you to say, obviously, you know, as much as you'd like to about this or, or, or anything else, but I, uh, mm -hmm. you, you, you mentioned or you refer to the lies, that they lied, that there are lies, that there are traditions, and then that there is a tradition of recognizing the lie yes. uh, that you're talking about in this, in this book. So to the extent you haven't already covered this, uh, say a word or two about what, what it is you're saying there and how does June Jordan figure into this tradition of, of exploding the lies. Yeah, so I, I, I do a kind of play in that chapter on the words lie and life and living. Um, and it's come, it comes from June's own words. Um, so the lying part comes out of her essay, Black Studies, Bringing Back the Person, 1969, uh, written in the heat of the Black student movement at City College. Um, she's saying that these students are tired of the lies and that's why they're doing what they're doing, right? But a, I think a year earlier, around the same year, she writes what she calls... Um, she writes about what she calls life. And she says that what, what, you, what we're really talking about with Black studies is life studies. And so what does it mean to sustain life? And so I kind of play around those particular things, but um, or those ideas. But I think June is at the, at the center of so, many, so much of this because as a poet who is connected to this impulse to explode, but also to emerge in a new way, like there's this renewal and this attempt to, not just an attempt, the, the ability to, to reframe um, by using the poetic that I think allows us, you know, to use, to really clear space, right? Cause that's so much, so much what's happening, right? Um, when it comes to black studies, my students come into the class and now they feel that they have space to expand and think differently and actually engage in ideas without the fear of, being marginalized within a particular space or without the fear of being disciplined, right? That's, I think that word discipline is really the word for a reason. People get disciplined when they step outside of the boundaries of academic discipline. And how do you discipline a poet? You really can't. Not a poet that understands the poetic in the way that June Jordan understands what the poetic does. And so I wanted to start there. I wanted to start with an artist, a poet, someone who actually taught black studies in that way to really clear space for us to consider what comes next in the book. And, you know, the idea of using June Jordan really comes out of me thinking about the fact that she was colleagues in a Black Studies uh, program with Tony Cade, who I also mm -hmm. talked about in the conclusion, with Addison Gale, with Adrian Rich, with Audre Lorde, right? And so many others. And it, I, and I had my, and it, it made me imagine. Well, what were the conversations like in that moment? And so we have the archives, and we have glimpses, and we have the articles. And Connor, uh, Connor Reed has written has written a new book called New York Liberation School, where he deals with it, right? But I was just imagining, like, all right, when these artists and these writers get together, what are they thinking about Black Studies? Because I know for sure it ain't what we're talking about in Black Studies now. And so I wanted to imagine that. So I'm not sure. Let me let me come back to that. Let me come. I want to. I want to. I want to. I, I keep. There's so many tributaries that are that yeah. are tempting here. Um, so you know, you you keep mentioning poetry. So I just it, it just caught my attention that it makes perfect mm -hmm. sense then that you would have uh, uh, you know uh, um, um, an accolade, uh, um, introductory praise from E. Ethelbert Miller saying at the book that 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 your book is a blueprint manual that helps to elevate the black imagination so that a new architecture can create a better world 
and I mean, I think that is a really perfect description of of what you're doing here and what is is so impressive and and and, and inviting about the work. Um, anyway, so I want I do, but I do want to come back to this to that to that point though about. You, what you have to say in here about disciplines and and I can't help it. I got a bad joke in here because you you have a line uh, uh, at one point you say something about um, um, being inside or outside the gates of the university and I kept help I couldn't help but thinking inside and outside the Henry Lewis gates. <laughs> I was like 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 you know like like you know um, because there is this again this this projection of of what this field or the history of black thought is is and uh um and then what you're saying nah man there's there's something else going on here that we're not doing or we're not able to do we're disciplined out of doing yeah um uh you say something about the university in in in, in that introductory section with you about june jordan the university forces them under were you I, I, in my notes? I quoted that. Are you quoting her, or were you saying that? And I, and and just if you would say something more about where that line is coming from, um, yeah. Anyway, you know, so the the notion of gates, right? The gates, the idea of gates comes out of the writing of June Jordan, mm -hmm. and it's more than just a metaphor, right? They, you know, universities are highly policed, like the physical plant of universities are highly policed all of, all around this country. And it's literally an enforcement, right, of this boundary, right? There are certain people who, who they mean to keep out. And when Jordan talks about that Black and Puerto Rican incursion on the gates, right, that's just not, those are just, aren't, those aren't just people who are happy to be there. Thank you for letting us in. I think a lot of us are just happy to be where we are. Oh my God, they gave me tenure. Thank you. As if these, yeah, as if you didn't work for it, right? And it's, 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 it's and I'm, I'm sure you've, you've probably experienced this before. Like, there are a lot of Black academics that enjoy the violence of being an academic. Not the, not the, not the liber, liberatory part, they enjoy the violent part. I'm take these students through this book. I'm gonna mark up their papers. I'm gonna break them. I'm gonna make. It's like, wait a minute. You enjoy the violence. They enjoy the politics of being in a department where you're hazing students or hazing young faculty. And I'm like, what have we done? What have we done when the relationship, our relationship to knowledge, within black spaces too, within black people in departments, is one where you enjoy the violent part. And we're trying to break through, right? And we're trying to break through the violence of black studies. And sometimes we enjoy the violent part. We enjoy the gates. We enjoy the fact that there are boundaries. Look how people are responding to this AP African American Studies issue in Florida. They are reifying the notion that this is good research. And I'm like, this is not an intellectual fight they're waging. They don't, it doesn't matter if it's good research. And what in fact, and what in fact is good research, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so, um, I, I just want to say that because the, these gates and discipline go together, right? And so the idea of being forced under, right? The people who decide, you know, that they're going to open, the, they, they're not going to be gatekeepers, in fact, that they're going to allow others into the space and they're going to take people out of the space, which I think is more important, right? Um, I think the notion of being forced under is how we are then, or they are then disciplined for not believing in the gates. Mm. Mm. And so that comes not only from June, it comes from Fred Moten talking about the undercommons, this notion of being doubly marginalized, marginalized because not only of race and class and gender and things of that nature, but also being marginalized because you're refusing to adhere to the model of excellence that will get people to maybe not think twice about your race, gender, or class. <laughs> right? We get forced under. We get, you know, literally given, you know. I'm being forced under right now at Howard. I'm, I'm given a, a class schedule that I, I didn't agree to, right? <laughs> so, I mean, is it because of my ideas or is it because of general incompetency? I don't know, I still can't figure it out. <laughs> but I know that, you know, this isn't normal. This isn't normal for someone to experience. The marginalization isn't normal. I talked about this at Sankofa, right? 
And when I say this, I'm not asking them to recognize it, but I'm saying no one at Howard in the PR department, in the provost office has ever mentioned that I've ever written a book. That's what we mean by Forrest Hunter. And so, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I do want to <laughs> echo one of the many things that you said. I want to echo uh, class schedules are violence. There is it is an act of violence. Class scheduling is is psychological warfare. It's all kinds of different kinds of other warfare. It's 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 abusive. Um, and, I think people render that yeah. abuse normative, right? What they yeah. would say is, "Well, I went through it, and so you got to go through it." As if yeah, somehow the thing to no, it's not normative. People make decisions about the abuse. And I think that's something that we need to really understand. Administrative logics are what they are because they are disciplinary logics. This is about consent. You know, this is, in my case, is often about making sure I say the right things in public, right? And so I, I, I understand what it's about. And, and even online. People who yeah. are, who are al aligned, but also aware of the violence of these administrative logics who make different decisions, you know? Yeah, that's that's yeah. Um, again, why I'm I'm thoroughly impressed with what you've done here. Um, all right, let me just move on a little bit, and we can double back to whatever I, uh, uh, that you'd like to, or that we can we can work in. And again, I intend for this to be at least part one of whatever, but at least just part one of whatever. Um, in it, I, I did skip ahead to Sylvia Winter's section uh, because I'm I'm fascinated by her work. I do not pretend to be able to intellectually keep up with her work, like a number of people that you've you you know whether it's whether it's Fred Moten. I mean, you make a number. I mean, it could be any actually it could be any of the people that you mentioned. You know, yeah. uh, Cedric Robinson, any any of them. But um, there's something about the vibe that even if I don't fully understand, I it's it, there is this vibe that I get from winter and others that I just, I'm just like, I just love it. And the, the very introductory epigraph that you have in her, the psychological subjugation of, of the conquered peoples would be ensured by the pen and the printing press as their physical subjugation had been ensured, assured by the gun. Yeah. So, so you talked about crying? Right, <laughs> we move to tears. That's what winter does for me. Word, yeah, I hear you. So, so talk about wh why, why, what that, why that, why you selected that, what that represents for what you're doing in the chapter, or what winter represents for what you're doing with this work. But the the pen and the printing press, I was like, that is, that's just, that's it, violence. Anyway, um, why is that a why is that atop that chapter that is from her book unpublished as of now black metamorphosis and when it's published i really look forward to seeing how people respond to it um mm. i hope people don't shy away from it because it is a it is lengthy um in manuscript it's over 900 pages so i don't know how that's going to translate into the, <laughs> the text. but that's mm -hmm. all right. People, people read like, you know, Stephen King novels and all this other stuff. They can make hey, it through. It's true. But, you, I, but read, you know, I think part of the reason yeah, it right. publishers sorry, rejected it in the 70s when it was written is like, we don't know what to do about this. I, I mean, so anyway, um, that book really establishes something that I think is critical to our understanding of not only race and class and Marxism and all of the things that she interrogates, right? It offers something critical in terms of our understanding of how this whole systemic order or political order actually comes into existence. She brings race in at a point where a lot of people don't bring race in, right? And that is at the creation of not necessarily finance capitalism, which some people rightfully start with, but at the creation of the conceit that human beings can have knowledge that orders the world. Race is, the, race is in at that point, right? And so if race is in at that particular point, then it causes us to really question what is happening with the intellectual development of Western knowledges, right? It's already racialized, which means that it's doing the same violence that the enslaver is doing with the gun, right? 
it's inescapable. In fact, not only that, right? It stabilizes that that intellectual project in really profound ways. Like the racialization piece stabilizes it. It gives it a coherence that then allows for political order to be justified, theorized, right? Developed. It allows for economic order to be theorized, justified, developed, so on and so forth. And so it just so happens that these are the social science disciplines that are supposed to save us, right? No, they're already based on this, right? This racialized particular system. And that particular quote is given at a moment in the book, it's at the beginning of, of Black Metamorphosis, where she's actually rooting this, not in the English like philosophical tradition, which most of us are trained in and taught to begin with, right? She's going back to the Spanish tradition, which is very interesting because she, you know, gets some of her degrees in, in Spanish and she teaches Spanish at, at UWE, University of West Indies. And so there's this point where she's linking this to Spanish philosophy, Spanish theology, and the Spanish attempt to, as she say, says, de-God, right? The political process. That de-Godding, meaning to take religious authority off the table, creates a new authority. And that new authority sees itself as the authority because it's looking at itself in relationship to the people that they are enslaving. Mm. That's her work. All right. <laughs> That's why I said it, 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 it. I'm slow with it. I'm gonna have to come back to it. That's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, I, I, I have. Again, but the thing is, she did like she did it in 900 plus pages. I tried to do it in like two minutes. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. So, so selfishly, I did want to ask you about because the other day, you know, in this back and forth that I'm having, at least by myself, between the the African centered or Afrocentric world and and the mm -hmm. so called Marxist or materialist worlds or whatever. Yeah. And I think, uh, let me mute. I think my mic is, now we're getting feedback from your mic. Hold on. I'm, let me. It's my mic. I need to put I in headphones. If you do have them, that would help. But it, 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 it just started. So now I think it, it's not, I'm not hearing it now. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, okay. it might be my input. But my point is, is that all, what, what, my fundamental issue is not to say that African centered thought or African people need Marx. It's to say that the critiques of Marx often don't seem to accurately describe Marx, A, and more importantly for me, B, don't appreciate enough what Africans have done working with or improving upon or struggling against Marx's ideas. So it's right. not to say let's hold him up. It's to say let's at least acknowledge. So when I read that part that you, you have in here from uh, uh, quoting winter talking about her own early engagement with marxism mm -hmm. and the quote ends with her saying it was not a matter of negating the Marxi marxian paradigm but of realizing that it was one aspect of something that was larger right am i interpreting that correctly or fairly to say that 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 i that she or i'm in agreement with her that we don't need to get rid of marx we don't need to be dismissive of marx we can elevate from marx and we have elevated from marx and that itself can be appreciated or, or am i wrong in that go ahead no, yeah I mean, she she i mean I, I have a transcript another transcript that i quote from earlier um that hopefully you know, at some point i can get permission to publish or have somebody else publish as well where she's actually working through this in even more detail, but she's working through it in conversation and in tribute to C.L.R. James. I mean, she's one of the most important interpreters of the work of C.L.R. James. And so I'll use him as an example, right? C.L.R. James is able to take Marxian thought, Marxian tradition and do something different with it, right? He is not disciplined by it, in other words. Sylvia so, so Winter, similarly, is not disciplined by it. And so for me, in my own work, in my own thinking, this notion of a paradigm or this notion of a theory only becomes problematic when it's read through as a disciplining theory or a disciplining paradigm. And I think what you explain is that, or what you would just explain or, or mention in terms of people using it to do things differently, to me is how uh, we should think about it, right? Um, it's almost, um, 
not almost it's 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 grounded in so many different people's creative and uh generative um intellectual work that is in conversation with but also in conversation beyond it and i'll just use an anecdote um that i always use to answer this particular question um most people think i would kind of go to cedric robinson on it but i go to sylvia hill um who you know longtime activist and you know ends up coming into the academy as well she i was interviewing her for black power chronicles and i think this is actually online now it's on youtube and i sort of asked her what her relationship uh to clr james was because as many people might not know or might know that they were involved in organizing the six pan african congress um here in dc and so I was trying to pro CLI James, and then you know the whole question of were y'all reading Marx, were y'all reading Hegel, so on and so forth. And she says, "Of course you were. We had to at that point, right?" And then I followed up, saying, "Well, well, how does it, you know, relate to some of these later discourses?" And she sort of like pauses and she says, "You know, if anything." This is a direct quote. She says, "If anything, we were Cabralists." And that sort of like opened up something for me. It opened me up again to the, the possibility of thinking around these notions of theorists and these notions of paradigms as existing also alongside, but they also existing as their own things as well, right? What if we said we are Cabralists? How does that then transform like what's underneath that theoretical uh, contribution. And so I think that's how we should probably think about it. But another way that I think we should think about it is a lot of this happens through, in and through people who are organizers and intellectuals, right? There's a moment where Marxist, Marxist thought clarifies things. And that moment is often when we are turned away, we are turned away from access to something that we think, think we are owed, <laughs> right? And so, to be very frank, I think most of us become radical in that sense because we have expectations of actually living through and benefiting from the liberal order that we all grew up in. And when those expectations are dashed, we become away looking for explanations. And there's Marxism and socialist thought, radical thought in general, offering a ready, -made, not ready made, but offering an explanation that makes a lot of sense to us in that particular moment. And this is what happens with winter. This is what happens with Cedric Robinson. This is what happens with so many others, right? And so the only real distinction that I would draw between that moment of realization and what happens to generate a kind of African-centered critique is there are many people who said that that moment of breaking from the liberal order and embracing the socialist order was not enough for me. I needed to find another foundation, another grounds for thinking. And to, to, to sort of think about it in that way, maybe you don't get there, however, without coming through a kind of Western radical tradition. Maybe that doesn't appear to you if you don't go through, as you say, that Marxian break too. That's kind of how I think about it. Hmm. All right, right on. Okay. Um... So I do want to ask, so, okay, in your section about Du Bois and then anything, if you want to, if there's more you wanted to say about Sylvia Winter, please do. Okay. Uh, in fact, I did want to ask you about when, when you make reference to the, to, and so this is the issue. Let me just share my, this is, this is my messed up method here. Like, so, so um, your publisher was kind enough to send me a, a PDF. Uh, I didn't realize until too late or later than it should have been that that is a protected PDF and I cannot make my notes on it and highlights and okay. scribble on it and do what I like to do. So I did what I was going to do anyway and bought at least the Kindle version. So, you know, so I have a purchased copy. I want to support the work anyway, but, but the, yeah. the, 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 um, so my notes are not synced up. So, for instance, I've scribbled where I was not able to write it and highlight it on the PDF. Something about you—you you refer. She's saying something about liberal ontologies. 
Um, and, and if I'm remembering, it's something about what I think is something I wanted to ask you about in terms of your chapter on Du Bois as well, which, uh, which uh, mm -hmm. a, a featured theme is again, what I said earlier, that there are people doing things with these people's ideas that don't really work when you look at what these people were saying themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's, my word is frustrating. Um, but so is, is, am I getting that reference right? When I, I can't find it fast enough now. I don't want to be, you know. Liberal you know, ontology? Yeah, the, that was the phrase I wrote down. So let me... <laughs> I'm gonna try to find it real quick <laughs> on the thing. I don't, I don't, I don't recall offhand. Um, uh, so nope, I'm already wrong. So I must have done something okay. wrong. It's not coming up in the in the in the search. Antalo. Anyway, my bad, man. My bad. So I don't know okay. what I was writing there, um, or what I was saying. So anyway, so I'll just go back to my original that 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 broader question, then, and we can in, mm -hmm. unless there's something you want to say about Sylvia Winter. Uh, I, I did want to ask you about what you were saying in terms of Du Bois and this this. Um, you even had a you had some good wording for this too. I'm not doing you. I'm not doing this justice. I gotta say right here, man. I'm. I, um, hold on a second. Where? Oh man, you had a really good phrase. Anyway, there's something uh, hesitance. You, I can ask you about that. Um, but uh, Obama ignoring his radicalism and connecting him to the normative logics of American exceptionalism. Oh, yeah, that was yeah, one phrase yeah. I wrote down. Yeah. Like, 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 like we have Obama because we had Du Bois right. <laughs> or something like that. Like, and that's just not me coming up with that out of my head. I've heard it. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah. Oh, I know. I've also written it. Uh, you know, Jelani Cobb has written that. Uh, there's a, also another book called From Du Bois to Obama, Charles Banner Haley. And so this is not just me imagining that people have actually done it. And it was, it, it was weird. That's the best way I can put it. It was weird to be a graduate student in the Obama era. <laughs> the optimism of that oh, moment. Man. Oh, man. Because um, that optimism filtered through the academy. And I'm like, you have to really ignore the Wall Street bailout, Occupy Wall Street. The response, you got to ignore so much. And it's sad that Black violence is what breaks people out of it, right? Trayvon Martin's murder, and, you know. It's sad that it took all that, you know? I'm sitting, you know, another Howard story. I'm sitting, I can't, I, 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 when I was in grad school, I had to come back to Howard a lot because sometimes Temple Phil just, uh. anyway, I'm sitting at Howard. You might actually been there. This is an ASCAD conference, 2011. Maybe. And um, Bob Brown is there. You don't expect to be necessarily to be at an ASCAD conference. And he says, they're bombing Africa right now. I'm like, what? Who? The black president is bombing <laughs> Libya. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute. I'm sitting at Howard and all this stuff. And what are we going to do? He's bombing Libya. There was no response. I mean, not no response, but you know what I mean. Like, mm -hmm. there was no response. And it felt like if we can't critique him when he's bombing Africa, And so it's sad that it didn't take that. It took, you know, at least on some small levels, right? You know, the emergence of, of this police police violence and things of that nature to kind of get people to wake back up a little bit. But 2012, I'm at University of Pennsylvania and they're honoring him. They're honoring Du Bois. And it just felt almost it felt circus-like to to appoint Du Bois into to a position posthumously. But they were you make a really good point about that too. Were, were, <laughs> were you quoting somebody, or because you make I a really good point, Tony Montero, because he he was belatedly invited right. to that conference, which is crazy. You, you do you're doing something with Du Bois in Philly, and Montero is not on the top of the list of invitees. <laughs> And but so you they, made the, you, the that his point was that now that communism is not the threat, now right. that you can bring him back. Because right. I think if I look at the, if I remember the timeline correctly, Morgan did something funky like that with him too, in yes. terms of even when he was was uh, invited, yeah, it, yeah, when he was uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. So anyway, but yeah, anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, and so you know, it was it was just an odd kind of performative thing, performative in a negative sense for me because while we should celebrate him, it just felt that. 
you know, the fact that you all didn't invite Tony Montero to the celebration at yes, first, yeah. and you know, just trying to fit them into these particular holes, categories, it felt more about the scholars who were at that event than it felt about you boys. And, you know, mm. Dr. Montero ruined me for that kind of thing because I took a seminar with him on Du Bois. And so he ruined me f- to accept that kind of thing, <laughs> for accepting that kind of thing. I could see it for what it was because of because of Tony Montero. And, you know, just being in that space is just, you know, that coupled with the Obama era optimism kind of caused me to write that this is really isn't, this really isn't about who Du Bois was. This is about how you all feel yourselves are, can be situated within the academy now that Du Bois is an ancestor. <laughs> so, so just very quickly, I'm not crazy. Uh, you did say here, and I don't know where it is on. It's in my Kindle copy, so it's hard to tell what okay. exact page it is. But you said, in, in reference to Sylvia Winter, her her work reveals that this hegemonic assumption of liberal ontologies can mm-hmm. be dangerous. Locating much of her critique in the question of quote the human. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and 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 right, I think that's in the the early pages of the book. Right, so you're, it is. You're, you're, that overview of what you're you're saying about each of these these figures, and that's sort of what I've taken away as a theme from what you're what what and what what is happening that you're describing to Du Bois, what has happened uh, um, uh, just in general with black thought and the concept of black studies, mm-hmm. uh, and is is such an important to me theme. Um, Anyway, very. I, I anyway. So I just that no, was, well. What, that's I, what I, where I, I thought you were going was oh, okay. Um, her uh, her essay uh, beyond liberal and Marxist feminisms, <laughs> where where she basically says, "Look, the whole premise of Western feminism in relationship to liberalism is to destroy man as the liber or man as free, right?" The whole premise of the Marxist interpretation of feminist struggle is to displace man as labor, right? And so one of the things that she's making making a particular claim around is these particular visions perhaps need to go beyond just thinking about replacing man as and actually think about a different way of being human than man. Oh, damn. No, see, that's why I gotta have enough. We I, we gotta do this again. I haven't gotten I haven't gotten that far actually, enough and know, deep enough into each chapter. So so there, that's that's mm, mm, that mm, essay, mm. which is not as widely read as some of her other essays, to me is mm-hmm. really important. Um, yeah, clearly, people people think it's attack. It's an, it's an outright attack on feminism, but it's really not. Um, she's saying that these versions of feminism don't get us to a place where we can actually bring in a deeper conversation. Uh, which is really uh, essential to thinking about, like, not just who we are, what we do, but also these questions of the very nature of existence, which she's always talking about, and how, when we don't start there, we inscribe somebody else's answers every time. And if I understood what I saw correctly in your chapter on Cedric Robinson, uh, you, oh man, I think there's a connection here. I'm just not going to probably put it together properly. But but you you say something about ro- how Robinson is is approached that sounds similar to what you were just saying of Winter's critique mm-hmm. about just simply replacing. In in other words, yeah. something yeah. like Robinson is not just saying black people are re- just replaced their thought to replace, use their thought to replace Marx. It is right. in of itself something to be dealt with. So essentially elaborate, please, <laughs> yeah. explain so, or clarify, you know, please. Yeah. I made it. So the Robinson connection is very important to the, to the whole book. Um, as you said earlier, you know, I had the, um, the biography on Robinson. Right. And I think, was that the first time I was on the show? We talked about black Marxism. I don't think ago. that book, I don't think you had finished that book yet. Oh, no, no, I hadn't. In fact, I hadn't, I hadn't even signed a contract for that book. Oh, I didn't okay. know I was going to okay. write that book. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, okay. So here's okay. the story. So here's the story. And I think you know, I told the story a few times, but I don't know if you've heard it. Um, I'm, I'm mostly teaching the book. I'm not really mm-hmm. writing about it. Um, he passes away 
and you know some folks on Twitter give me opportunities to actually write about them. Um, and then one of those folks ends up Kurt Newman, who's one of the editors, ends up sending it to Robin, Robin DJ Kelly. Mm-hmm. So me and Robin DJ Kelly start having you know, a bit of a dialogue around this, and you know he's doing the family research because he was the obituary. Uh, he wrote the obituary. Mm-hmm. And it's a really uphill battle because as close as they were, Cedric never really talked about his own life in that way. Um, and so to make a very long story short, this book of Black Study actually is in the works as I am trying to transition from my research on the Howard protest. Mm-hmm. Um, I had basically completed that research, was now drafting that book. And then um, I go ask Robin a question. It's a really simple question, actually. Like, what was Cedric's relationship to the uh, National Conference of Black Political Scientists? That's something I wanted to know. Like, did he ever go to their conferences, engage their work? Because, you know, Mac Jones and them, Ron Walters, they're trying to execute something similar mm-hmm. with relationship to the study of politics. Anyway, mm-hmm. I finished a chapter on Robinson like five years ago. And I sent it to Robin because there was some biographical stuff that I wanted to check on. And he's like, well, maybe you should do something larger. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do anything larger. And then he says, you know, think about it. Because he says, I'm not going to be the person that writes Cedric's biography. And I don't know. Well, I do kind of know why. Um, but to make a to continue to make this long story short. Hold up. Well, hold up, though. Hold up, though. Wait, wait. I got, wait. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Wait, wait. Is, are we, hold up, hold up. No, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> like, what? No, I'm just, no, I'm, I, I admit I'm very curious about that, why he wouldn't be the one to do oh, it. Oh, well, I think yeah, it was, anyway. it was like the closeness was too much for him. Mm. This is just me speculating. Oh, I see. That's, that's, Give me that's, Robin if, if that's not accurate, but. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I think there was there was a, there was a closeness. I think about you know my own elders and whether or not I could write something about them. Like, eh. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. There's that, but also I finished the chapter, sent it to him get, to get that, and he says, you know, write the book. And I'm like, that ain't my thing. That's not my thing. But a year later, a publisher approaches me and says, "Well, Robin sent us." Okay, (laughs) and so that's really uh, you know I talked to Elizabeth Robinson about the project and things of that nature, and so that's really how I got um, got invited to write the Cedric Robinson biography. But I wanted to say that to say that this was first, like Mm -hmm. a black study was first. It was even before the Howard protest book, Mm -hmm. and because it was first, it's the one that I thought the longest about. And so that chapter on Robinson is what I thought I needed to write, but it ended up being only a snippet of what I needed to write. And together with the biography, the difference is, I think, and, you know, shout out to Jared Ware and Joshua Breon from Make the News Are Killing Capitalism, because they had a way of seeing this that I didn't necessarily see. He said, mm. "This is a, this treatment is more about the terms of order than it is about black Marxism. and that's kind of where um, I wanted to make a particular kind of claim, and that is one: you have to read those two books together to get either of them. I think to really fully understand. Either. I did want to ask you, but I mean, you said yeah. one of the flaws that every well, not everybody, but many people have in in trying to place and assess and use Robinson is that they don't read everything." Yeah. Um, yeah, I know I'm guilty of that I haven't read Beyond Black Marxism and I haven't studied right. that book. I've read it, right. but that's not the same thing. So that's that's deep. I, I, anyway, yeah. so yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So I, you know, it's it's the one book that people put down immediately um, after right after they pick it up, um, and that's because part of it's the language. Also, part of it is one cannot see the immediate application of this to the Black liberation struggle. It's not immediate, right? for those who are reading for those particular reasons. And so it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of, you know, sitting down and say, okay, let me just take a month and just focus on this, right? Um, but one of the things that I was able to do by doing some of the research, um, really not even doing research, just going back to his other works, is that Robinson has not an obsession, but a deep interest in charisma. 
as a concept. And for him, charisma isn't bad. Charisma is appropriated by bad actors. And he starts that engagement with Malcolm X. So his first article is Malcolm X as a charismatic leader. He then teaches courses on black charismatic movements. He says the movements are more important than the leaders. Charismatic movements. And then so why is he talking about charisma? Terms of order, that, that it was just his dissertation, takes the conversation around charisma back to its source in people's relationship to experiences that transform their lives. And whether that is religious ecstasy, whether that is someone you know offering or people offering each other the thing that allows them to survive, it's almost like a, a metaphysical experience that human beings have when they realize that life is meaningful, right? Kind of describing what people think they hear when they hear a charismatic <laughs> speaker, right? Oh my God, this is so meaningful now. It changes my life, right? Um, that notion, Robinson says, is at the center of political leadership because the peoples who are structuring market societies, they need representatives to then convince the people that this is the best way to organize their own lives. And so what's the thing that the people have that these actors need in order to convince them that leadership is natural, right, is necessary, and that thing is charisma. And so politicians have charisma for a particular reason. And Max Weber and others talk about how this then, you know, charisma, charisma then becomes part of the bureaucratic like ethic of, of a particular society. And so what Robinson is saying, we have to challenge the myth of leadership because people don't follow leaders because they believe in leaders. People follow leaders because they believe in charisma. And that to me was something that I felt had to be understand and has implications for how we think about black radical movements, obviously, right? And so Erica Edwards writes about this as well. Um, oh, I'm about to blink on her title, Fictions of Black Leadership. I think I, is the I'm, title. I'm on, I'm, I'm on, I'm on um, I got it. I'm Erica, on Erica's a brilliant thinker. Um, just came out with a book that, that I, in fact, you should interview Erica because her most recent book talks about how yeah, black fictions women. of charisma and fictions of black leadership. Okay. Thank you. Charisma right. and fictions of black leadership. Her most recent book, The Other Side of Terror, talks about how the American war machine uses black women. <laughs> mm. Right? On the positive and the negative side. So we're critiquing it, right? Mm. Black women are critiquing it, but also black women are being forced to approve American imperial power through the mechanisms of visibility. So what's the relationship between Oprah and Toni Morrison, really? Like, he's not just choosing my books because he like <laughs> Anyway, all right. The Other Side of Terror. <laughs> so the other move that Robinson then makes that I think is really critical, well, two, there's two more moves. I'll just speak about one. And this is the relationship to Black Marxism. It's not simply, you know, that capitalism comes out and is already racialized and these things are already embedded in it, and then it becomes this force that everybody's struggling against right now. It is also the case that in order to have this form of capitalism have this power, it has to present itself as order. Mm. And how do we do that? Through political leadership. So the relationship between political leadership, order, and the manifestation of the thing that we're fighting against is the fact that it appears as if it's natural, which is also important for us as, as people who are struggling against it. If we can get folks to recognize, and I think we do this, right? And I think people have done this and have recognized this, but if we can get people to realize that, that it's all actually a fiction, then that gives us a different confidence and different grounds from which to struggle. And the Black radical tradition has always, I think, understood that. There's nothing sacred about this system. <laughs> we will blow it away. We will figure out something else, right? You like ask you, in a dangerous moment where charisma is being, simply Black leadership, and this is what Erica's book is about, 
Black leadership is then taking the political appropriation of charisma and trying to convince Black communities and being quite effective in convincing Black communities that this is the only way. What yeah. Robinson would say is they needed to do that because we were being effective in doing something else. Right on. I mean, you have him asking or you're, or you're asking, what if disorder is not chaos? I love yes. that part. I love that. Right. What right. if disorder is not chaos? Disorder and chaos are not the same thing or don't right. have to be. Right. Uh, anyway, I love What's that. more chaotic than what's happening now? They literally are about to restart the planet. I mean, <laughs> right. <that's chaotic. laughs> um. All right. So, so moving on, because, 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 because I, I, I am going to have to leave. Okay. Uh, closer to two thirty or two forty ish. I could probably stretch it. Unfortunately, that's this is I messed up. This is all my fault. This whole day, <laughs> this whole I was off all day, and I messed up the whole day. And what's the problem is I've been off all day for a couple of weeks. So that's what's that's okay. what's really messed up. So anyway. Okay. But 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 uh, so please forgive me, everybody. Forgive me. And again, this is the first of of what I hope will be at least maybe a whole bunch of them. But anyway, so because I got so many, there's so much here. I got to I got to at least bring up uh, 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 your your chapter on Baba Jake, Jacob Carruthers. Yeah. I I will admit it seemed it may seem like it. Check me on this. Like like at first glance, it's like that's that's an odd inclusion inclusion mm -hmm. in this list of thinkers um mm -hmm. i i have mad respect for baba jake uh i, I even had the pleasure of, of meeting him I've, I've always thought his presentation style was as deep and knowledgeable as anyone but as accessible and friendly and humble i i, I yeah. intellectual warfare is one of my favorite books i okay. mean i thought i thought with all due respect uh, to everyone else involved, I thought the Asante book recently on Karanga did Jake a little dirty and leaving him, you know, not enough, you know, didn't give him. You know, I was like, where's I was like, wait a minute. You talk about Chicago and like he's I was like, yeah. And then very lastly, as I was uh, uh, proposing to my now wife at, at uh, the Great Pyramid in Kemet. Uh, that was exactly the time, unfortunately, where where, where Jake passed, where oh, he made his transition. Wow. So yeah, while I was in Kemet, he transitioned. So it was it was like a, wow. I don't obviously bigger than that, but but it was it was weird and 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 odd right. and for me, but whatever. But so I but I, all that to say, I was very happy to see that he was in there, even as I'm saying it was. It, I thought initially when I saw the name, I was like, wow, okay, that I wouldn't yeah. have expected that. So yeah. so. Talk about Jacob Carruthers and why he f factors for you so heavily uh, uh, in this book. I read Carruthers before I read anybody else in here. <laughs> That's number one. Mm, mm. <laughs> uh, number two, I'm glad you mentioned intellectual warfare, right? Because that signals something really important. It signals the relationship between the continuation of a nationalist African-centered approach to knowledge that I don't think gets enough intellectual attention. Mm. It doesn't get enough attention within Black studies beyond the route that Malefia Asante and others paved. It doesn't get attention beyond Black studies probably at all. Um, and so it shaped me. So I can't not, right? <laughs> I can't not, even if I wanted to, I couldn't not. And so, it's, it's, it's critical for me. Um, but even beyond that, there is a similar relationship that Carruthers has to really two disciplines that mirrors the other folks in this book. I was very drawn to Carruthers' critique of political science. When I first read him um, as an undergrad at Howard, he writes in, um, the two pieces in intellectual warfare, an alternative to political science, and then um, thinking about European thought. And so that just stood, that just stayed with me through my throughout my graduate school experience. It's like, who are the people that are helping us create the kind of space to maneuver differently? And then the work that he, Anderson Thompson, and others in the Chicago School did around Africana historiography, to me, that's critical 
especially insofar as people who are may or may, may or may not be involved in the academy or university as closely as we are, see the importance of history differently than the disciplinary approach to history that we do see in the academy. And sometimes the people in the academy try to appropriate that interest and say, no, no, Peniel, we're not talking about your history. We're talking about actual connections to the past that are not given in and through a particular narrative of American exceptionalism. In fact, this is what Anderson Thompson called entertainment history. We're not talking about, black people don't want to be entertained by history. This is why we, I think that's part of the reason why there's this kind of animus towards these kind of movies, right? This is not about entertainment. <laughs> it's about liberation. History for liberation, the past. And so how do you actually write that? How do you actually break from the disciplinary tradition of history and write history from an actual African-centered framework that is not about saying we were great because this is not Carruthers' project. Carruthers' project actually, you know, has a critique in many respects of the kind of hierarchies and things of that nature that people like to latch on to the African past. He says, it's not that we didn't have, there weren't people who were privileged, is that privilege wasn't the way that they made decisions, <laughs> right? And so how do we get to a point where we can actually write that clearly and develop a narrative that is actually clear around that? This is a very serious undertaking that Carruthers devotes um, his life to doing. And I think that needs to be talked about. It needs to be elevated, even as you know, many of the people who may pick up this book will, will not expect to see that. But as he says, you know, African people must break the chains that link our ideas to European ones, right? And he is one of the peoples that I think, um, he doesn't, he's one of the people that I think begins the process um, of that breaking and also models it, as you said, in terms of his character. I think that's also critical for Black studies. Like we have to also think about ourselves and how do we become models of good character? Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that takes a lot of work. And Carruthers kind of represents that. The other thing I like about that chapter, um, even within our African-centered communities, um, there's a lot of information that I you know, took from um, his widow's work, Ife Carruthers, but also uh, from his History Makers interview that talks about his background. Um, his background, you know, going all the way back to his grandfather, who was uh, great-grandfather, who was the founder of an all-Black town in Texas, um, his work, um, as a student activist, his work um, in graduate school, like his dissertation is, ooh. <laughs> he's attacking the notion of nonviolent civil disobedience in 1963, right? Like, oh, damn. Right at, right at the core. And um, actually, I think it's published in 65 or so, somewhere in there, 65, 66. And so, but it, whatever, whenever he's writing it, the so called transition from civil rights to black power hadn't happened yet. And he right. shares that with, with, with Cedric Robinson who's critical of the civil rights nonviolent approach in 1963. And so there's something about that. Um, but also just the general disposition towards um, Western thought, to me, his notion of fundamental alienation um, is critical mm. to understand, like, you know, what is the relationship between knowledge, metaphysics, and how did Western thought sort of disaggregate those two things? And what are the implications for that? Because it's not that you got rid of God, you just made God something else, right? <laughs> so anyway, I can go on. Nah, man, so, oh, there's so many different, oh, so like, like, all right, I'll, 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 let me, I'll save that one in case we have time because I want to give you okay. some some room to breathe on 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 this one. But but I want to ask it. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask this big broad thing, and then you do what you would. So okay. like, because I, I just want to ask one more thing, and then and then because then so we don't. I don't want to rush you to 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 answer. So I'll give you some time to and then to bring up whatever else you might want to bring up. But mm -hmm. um, in your in your chapter about Robinson, you you quote him as saying that black studies is a critique of western i think you're quoting him but you're or the point is made that black studies mm -hmm. is a critique of western civilization so i wanted to to to, mm -hmm. to highlight that to as a transition into also asking you to talk about the what you write about in the conclusion which is also a reflection or a discussion of tony k bambara uh and and um what stuck out to me was your your concluding your your 
So what I'm saying is if black studies is a critique of Western civilization, and then you're talking about what is being done with the with the punditry and the mm -hmm. the, the, the 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 celebrity or what you know and and uh so anyways so I love that you said this because it gives me an opportunity to really talk about the context of that quote. Okay, cool. um, you know, it's Robinson's talking to an anarchist like via an email interview. It's, it's crazy. Um, and it's interesting because CLR James, he's actually quoting CLR James by saying this. And if you go to the original CLR James, in fact, I think this is now floating. Um, shout out to Zalika, um, sister who is like, I think she's responsible. She would probably say I'm responsible, but um, this the CLR James quotes that are floating around about black studies is because um, I went and found the context for Robinson using the black studies as a critique of civilization quote, right? Um, and what James says in that article, it's in the Black Scholar, CLR James interview by the Black Scholar, 1970. Shout out to the Black Scholar, six. man. I want to say 76. That might not be right. Um, but in that article, and this is why, you know, research is important. Um, but James says, in order for Black studies, and this is paraphrasing, in order for Black studies to actually be supported, the whole architecture of Western thought has to change. And so Robinson distills that into Black studies must necessarily critique that architecture, or Black studies is a critique of Western civilization. But there's a way to critique Western civilization. The pundit class is not critiquing Western civilization. They're asking for entrance into Western civilization. That's the critique. I'm not there. <laughs> I'm not included. Or my inclusion makes me feel bad. Or my lack of inclusion makes me feel bad. And so that becomes not a critique of the whole architecture of Western thought. It becomes, I got a problem with the architecture of Western thought. I just feel some kind of way about it in this particular moment of punditry. And I think this is a distinction that I want to raise around the whole Ron DeSantis, Florida AP African American Studies conversation that's happening. Look at the defenses. I'm interested in the defenses, right? Whether it's on CNN, MSNBC, or whether it's in print, people are being interviewed all left, all left and right. I get too many media requests a day for me to respond. I'm like, I'm not responding to a media request because unless y'all give me an opportunity to write two or three paragraphs in response, you're gonna misread this because it's complicated. It's nuanced, and here's the nuance. Many of the people who are responding are simply saying that this is an attack on African-American history. My colleague said that, you know, all we gotta do is recognize that African-American history is American history. And he says, not recognizing that is un-American in and of itself. And I'm like, blown away. This is the response? Because By the, the way, I'm two. I'm I'm two. I'm two episodes in in the new Hulu thing of the 1619 project, and that's the whole thing. Another example. Another example, right? I could I could only watch the trailer because the trailer the trailer <laughs> ends saying that we have just as much claim to America as anybody else. That's it, and it's just two hours so Which far of them making justify that claim. That's it. Explains oh, why right. she's at Howard in, in this moment in Howard's history, and it also explains the ways in which this has been embraced by the liberal side of things, which obscures the radical critique that has always been there of this project, right? And well, so, by the way, all this stuff about Howard, we take this off the table because I actually have an app. I forgot I have an application in at Howard somewhere. So let's <laughs> let's let's chill on on that wonderful institution and and what what may be one day my colleagues. <laughs> Look, I'm just going. <laughs> I've been it's here. True, I do. Know. I did. I do. I actually do. But that's yeah. Go but ahead. I think it's it's important because this is this is the response to this to this moment. It's like this retrenchment into us having a claim. Also, the ADOS movement, right? We have a claim to this, right? And that claim can only can only exist if one actually denies that there is a radical alternative that we've all, always also believed in. Mm. And so black studies 
is the radical alternative to the to the argument that they're using to defend black studies in Florida. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and so the defenses are wrong. Not they're not wrong to defend, but the actual intellectual content of the defenses are wrong and have nothing to do with black studies. And this is the danger that maybe Ron DeSantis and his team figured out, but they probably didn't. But this is also the thing. And, you know, lovingly, I worked on the AP, African American Studies, of course, there are many people, you know, that I respect in, on, on those writing teams. But there's a very clear attempt to compromise with certain ways of existing within the normative American academic landscape that Black studies really, in its origins, and in its political impulses should not and have not accepted. And the question becomes, can you teach that to K through, sorry, can you teach that in, in the high school system? That's what we're really testing. And I don't know. Mm. Mm. All right, so, ah, oh, man. Um, let me ask you real quick, the, 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 I have to admit a couple, I don't know, it's maybe even a year ago now. I don't even know how long ago it was, but I saw, I don't ever know what you mean when you do this uh, or when I used to see it. I don't even know if you're on social media like that anymore. I'm not, but I saw you tweet. Oh my God. <laughs> all you put up there was racial capitalism. And I don't, I don't know if you had it in quotes or if you had like an emoji eye roll or something, but it was something like, I don't, all I was, I, I wanted to ask you, so I'm saving it for now, like in the context of your work and, and, and Robinson and his association and, and then the, the, the stuff that, I don't know. So what, what were you, what is it, what is, when you see racial capitalism being discussed popularly, I guess. <laughs> I think, you know, cause I don't have another hour. <laughs> right, no, I'm, not now, not today. But you will, I promise but, you. I mean, just in a quick nutshell, I think part mm -hmm. of what, and I talk about this in the book as well, right? Mm -hmm. Part of what I see happening is people are attracted to the study of race, which is great. Let's study it. Let's study its, let's study its imbrication with capitalism. And part of the problem with that is that's where it start, starts and that's where it ends. And it's like, mm -hmm. okay, race and capitalism. It's almost like, Let's create a new term to talk about race and capitalism at the same time. And there's nothing resembling whether wherever we locate the origins, there's nothing resembling any connection to that. And so I don't remember that tweet, but I do remember one of my other tweets where I basically said people just use racial capitalism to put a label on what they were going to do before they even <laughs> encountered the term. And so when you see racial capital, when I see racial capitalism, what I see is I'm a scholar of race inequality in class or whatever I am a scholar of. Let me use this term because everybody else is using this term. And then let me turn around and do what I was going to do before I ever heard of it. Oh, day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what I see. That's how I see it. Um, but this is why I'm saying stay tuned, everybody, because it's coming back. That's why I'm <laughs> no, saying it's coming the hate back. Logo. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's coming back. No, I love it. I, and the same thing, even in passing, I, 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 if I if I read it correctly, it felt like what I was even asking uh, Frank Wilderson in the last time he was here, like when you said the I think you used the word imprimatur of Afro pessimism. Yeah. Like it, it, it's like. Even f whether people agree or disagree, like I, I read it as a. a, 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 a um, a new, I'm not even trying to be dismissive by, or disparaging by saying rebranding, but a rebranding of, of race first analysis so or like, what do you, what did you, what were you saying when you, when you, I don't know, go ahead. Yeah. So there's, so there's like the term, just like, just like with Marxism, right? There's the term and there's the concept, there's the person. Right. The okay. term, and then there, these things mm -hmm. have lives after that. Right. And so what's interesting to me, and this has nothing to do necessarily with the intellectual validity of Afro pessimism, as much as it has to do with the way that there's a certain conversation in black studies now that starts and ends with Afro pessimism, as mm -hmm. if there were no other variations of black studies that ever existed. There was a time on social media, if you mentioned black studies, people assumed 100% that you're talking about Afro pessimism. Oh, wow. there, that was actually a time that that happened. And that, that's really um, something that, that, that struck me because 
um, these are these were mostly younger scholars who are learning about Black studies on the internet because they're not being offered these courses in their universities for the most part, or they're being offered these courses through literature departments, comparative literature, right? And so for them, Black studies is Afro-pessimism. And so mm. part of what I wanted to do with that little line is say, Afro-pessimism has a right to exist, right? But there are other conversations that have been had under the umbrella of Black studies that we also should, should bring into the conversation. Um, so yeah, that's what I mean. Listen, it's it's I, I rarely feel this bad about being the one to end an interview, but I <laughs> so but it, it, you know, listen, so I apologize to you again to the remixers in the audience who we're not gonna have time to 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 engage today. Well Jared and Josh had me for three hours, so <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to say, I am going to, I, it's already going to be on the, the redesigning syllabus, the, the living document, as we sometimes say, or, uh, uh, these things are. Mm -hmm. um, the millennial, uh, uh, Millennials Are Killing Capitalism interview with you is definitely going to go on there, um, uh, as are a whole bunch of their other work. I mean, I, I actually, yeah. you know, they, they it's a little bit, it's a little bit humbling. To, the way to that they read? Interviews. I mean, oh my yeah, God. It's a little bit, it's a little bit. <laughs> It's a little bit, but reading your work was a little bit humbling. I'm not going to front. I mean, for it, you know, sometimes it, it eases the pain when I compare, you know, my CV to others. I'm like, yeah, but I'm at an HBCU. I, you know, I, I, I'm teaching four fours. Like, I don't have that. And then here you come with stuff like this. And I know there are others. I'm just saying, you know, yeah. but it, it is. So again, I want to end where I started. I am, in, and I don't mean to sound condescending when I say this. I'm immensely oh. proud of you yeah. for having been able to do this work in the context of where you are in the situation, the quality of it on its own, what you're inviting us to consider. I love all of it. I appreciate you for doing it and congratulations. And I, I really can't wait until uh, the next uh, time you're here to talk more about it. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very and much. and I, don't take, I don't take being here for granted. I mean, no, it's, thank you. I just say it like that. It, no, it's an honor all the way around. So listen, thanks to you. Thanks to everybody else who was seeing this live, to those who will see this later. And my, again, deepest apologies for my scheduling error. As Fred Hampton used to say, we say peace to you because we know you're willing to fight for it. Thanks again to Professor Myers. Definitely get this book and we will be talking much more about it, uh, even maybe before you get back here because there's a lot to get to. But anyway, I love it. Thank you. Congratulations. Peace until next time, everybody. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.